beautiful grain. When I dip this grain out, it reminds me of the scripture, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth forth from the mouth of God. Today's a special day. Today's the day of a constitutional forum. I'm gonna get these chores done, and then I'm gonna head for town. Come on, girl. When I was a boy, I used to like to go with my dad when he went out to do the milking. He had cows. He was a dairyman to start with, and then when I was a little older, he got just a few cows. He used to tell me stories and teach me scriptures. I like to hear the stories about when he was a little boy. One of the stories that he told was about his grandmother. He says he remembers when he was five years old, playing in the kitchen on the floor in his grandmother's kitchen. They were farming people actually ranchers, lived a long ways from town. In the summertime, they would share labor when their haying was on, and sometimes there'd be a crew of haying people at your house for dinner, and they'd be like 10. And so this grandma, she'd have to prepare a meal for 10 starving men. She didn't have a modern kitchen like we have today. She had a table in the middle of the room where she did her food preparation, and she had to go out and dip water from the spring to get water for, for cooking. And grandma always wore an apron. My dad says that grandma would hum often cheerful tunes. And then frequently, every, every once in a while, she'd look up and she'd say, I love the Lord Jesus. My dad says as a five-year-old boy, he didn't know who Jesus was, but he knew if grandma loved Jesus, so did he. I'm grateful for good parents because I've learned from my parents also to love the Lord Jesus. We live in the desert here. We had to hire a well driller to drill a well. Water is precious. Jesus met a woman at a well and asked for a drink. She dipped her vessel and gave him one. He then offered her some living water, and he said, if you'll partake of the living water, you'll never thirst again. She didn't understand. Many of us don't understand that a part of the living water is freedom. It's putting into practice the proper role of government, upholding and defending it, proclaiming liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. Chores are done, time to go to the Constitutional Forum. Come on, follow me. happy to be here today. In this room are some of my very best friends. It's almost an emotional thing to see you and meet you this morning and enjoy your enthusiasm and your good spirits. I've been looking forward to gathering here and I don't have a happy message. I thought how fun it would be to have an entertainment message. You know, we could do a song and a dance and, and uh, everybody could laugh and smile at good jokes, but that's not what I came for. So I'm going to have a serious message and hopefully you'll have your pencils and papers ready and try and take some notes and during the course of the day I'll be circulating around learning from these other speakers and if you have questions you can perhaps try them on me during the, you know, during the course of the day. So we guess, uh, we, I guess we'll officially start. Uh, as I was looking over the material and trying to decide what to present, I started getting my books out and purchasing other books and as we looked over the books and 
look at all the titles. I thought, well, I'll just bring a stack of them and kind of give you a feel from the source material of where I come from. I'm a reporter, not an original researcher. I didn't go all over the world and doing, doing this research. So I gathered it from books like this one right here, From Freedom to Slavery, The Rebirth of Tyranny in America by the noted trial uh, attorney Jerry Spence. And we have from Judge Robert Bork, Slouching Toward Gomorrah. Now, that's a kind of a strange title, but this is a very helpful, perhaps this is the most important book I've read in the last five years, Slouching Toward Gomorrah. And this one describes it well. The Stealing of America by another fine scholar and author, John Whitehead. And we have Secret Societies and Subversive Movements, which is an interesting history of bygone ages. Here's one by a Catholic father that I dearly enjoyed, Conspiracy Against God and Man. Again, a research report on history of the past. Freedom on the Altar by William Norman Grigg, excellent reading on current events. And particularly his subtitle is The UN's Crusade Against God and Family. Here's Hollywood versus America. This man described himself as a very, uh, as a practicing Jew. I, I, I note that because we have books on the table here from Protestants, Catholics, Jews, and Mormons. Yeah, I do. I want one up here from a Mormon. So we're, we're, we're using, this is Hollywood versus America. Here's one that's extremely informative on our banking system and the problems dealing with our money. The Creature from Jekyll Island. Now that sounds like a mystery. It is. It's like reading a detective story as, you read the, as he unfolds the history of money going way back in time. I don't have the book. I made the mistake of checking it out from the library and then I had to return it. But this, this represents the same text material. The Demoralization of Society by Gertrude Himmelfarb, professor of history in New York City University. Here's a, most of these books are reasonably new. Here's one that's brand new. The Forgotten Virtue by Molly Sorensen. Very worthwhile reading as we try to understand the problems facing the nation today. And don't forget some of the old ones. <laughs> We're going to use this one today. The Naked Communist. Uh, recently, when I was with my, at the, up the uh, ophthalmologist office, getting my eye examination, he, he was commenting that he used to listen to lectures on communism, and he'd heard what Skousen said, and he believed it then, but he said, that's all proven to be wrong now. Communism died, and so we'll mention some of the things from this text today as we unfold the message that, our, uh, that we've prepared. Those and other excellent text materials have assisted us in developing the thoughts you're about to hear. A couple of years ago, there was a, a message in a magazine that I read regularly, and uh, the speaker was uh, Joseph Worthlin. And among other things, he said, the enemies of God are destroying the core foundation of this land. And that's been very thought-provoking to me for the past couple of years. How are they doing that, is what I kept asking myself. What is going on? Is there something I'm missing? The enemies of God are destroying the core foundation of this land. And I was kind of confused. And so one of my friends helped me with a picture here. We're going to read a quotation about this picture. This is a full picture. Can you see it? Can you see what's going on? It's an action shot. Kind of confusing, isn't it? And the caption above says, it will look like a great booming, buzzing confusion. And I was confused. How were the enemies of God destroying our land? So I'm going to read a quotation. We're going to take you back now to a 1978 magazine where the Freeman Institute that I was working for then published uh, some quotations from Foreign Affairs magazine. Now background slightly on Foreign Affairs. Time magazine said of Foreign Affairs magazine that it is the most influential magazine in America. Now, I don't think any of you probably subscribe to foreign affairs. Now, you would do well if you did. I suppose you would learn a lot. I don't subscribe to it. I only have read excerpts from it and seen it a few times. In Foreign Affairs magazine, the elite leadership of the world publishes their opinions to one another, suggesting ways to guide the world government that they're planning to put in place. And so they share their thoughts and ideas through the vehicle of a quarterly magazine that's considered to be, by Time magazine, 
the most influential magazine in America. Now I'm going to quote from Foreign Affairs magazine. I'm quoting from a man named Richard Gardner. Richard Gardner at that time was serving as our ambassador to Italy. Today he is the ambassador to Spain, appointed by President Clinton to Spain. So the man is still, at least it was a year or so ago, he was still alive and well doing his service in Spain. In Foreign Affairs magazine, writing to other members of the Council on Foreign Relations, he was explaining the strategy that would be most effective in establishing a world government according to their viewpoint. After asking a question, and the question is this uh, condensed down, if instant world government is not immediately possible, what hope for the future is there? Now here's his answer to that question. The hope for the foreseeable future lies not in building up a few ambitious central institutions of universal membership and general jurisdiction as was envisaged at the end of the last war. Now what institutions was he referring to that were envisaged at the end of the war? You remember the United Nations and for, for prior to that was the League of Nations. He says, that's not the way we're going to succeed at our goal. At the, uh, but rather in a much more decentralized, disorderly and pragmatic practice or process of inventing or adapting institutions of limited jurisdiction and selected membership to deal with specific problems on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, what did he say? We're not going to have a great big universal organization like the League of Nations or the United Nations. Now this is 20 years ago he made this statement. He says we're going to do much better if we have decentralized separate organizations doing their own specialty thing. In Judge Bork's book, Slouching Toward Gomorrah, he makes a list and says this is only a partial list of organizations that are doing just what Richard Gardner stated. Judge Bork's list includes these. The radical feminist organizations, the black extremist organizations, the animal rights groups, radical environmentalist, homosexual organizations, multiculturalist organizations, People for the American Way, the ACLU, the National Abortion Rights Action League, the National Organization for Women, Planned Parenthood, and then he said that's only a partial list and you can certainly think of another dozen if we just brainstorm for one minute of organizations that are doing what he describes as institutions of limited jurisdiction and selected membership to deal with specific problems on a case-by-case -case basis. In short, the house of world order will have to be built from the bottom up rather than from the top down. It will look like a great booming buzzing confusion, but an end run around national sovereignty eroding it piece by piece, will accomplish much more than the old-fashioned frontal assault. He likens it then to a football game. <coughs> An end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, will have a much better effect than the old-fashioned frontal assault. So here we have the, uh, the opposition team running around the end, and I thought about labeling this character, we could put on his helmet CFR, as this was a strategy being suggested to the CFR members. Uh, he could also represent other organizations that are these special interest groups that are taking an end run around the American sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, and many of us are confused as to what's happening. Because we've likened it to a football player, or they likened it to a football player, I was intrigued with this picture. I thought we could label that America Today, or possibly the individuals that have been in the freedom cause for many years. Some of you have. And I think, you know, some of us might look like this. We've been pounded and hammered, and we're wore out, and we want to say, oh, let's just throw in the towel we lost. But we haven't. 
So at the end of the, at the presentation, I've got another picture of this guy all ready to go. <laughs> this was a clothing advertisement, advertising how good you can wash clothes. <laughs> but his facial expression and the pain he's in is what I want you to see here. Many years ago, we're going to go back historically several times and, and try and draw threads of history up to the current time. Many years ago, in 1647, as the early settlers were trying to establish a new land where they could worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience, one of the early things they did was establish schools. And the act was known as the Old Deluder Satan Act. Satan being the old deluder. Ever, here, here's a statement or two coming directly from the Old Deluder Satan Act. It being one chief project of the old deluder, Satan, to keep men from the knowledge of scriptures, it is therefore ordered that every township in this jurisdiction, after the Lord hath increased them to the number of fifty householders, shall then forwith appoint one within their town to teach all such children as shall resort to him to write and read. Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well. The main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, and therefore lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. That goes on, there's more to it. Those are direct quotations from the old deluder Satan Act, encouraging the communities to teach the children to read so that they wouldn't be deluded by Satan. I cannot stress strongly enough the importance of good books. Well, that philosophy was practiced in America for about 200 years, and we became the greatest free nation in the history of the world. Our schools were neighborhood-centered, parent-directed, and professionally assisted. We didn't have computers, and we didn't have any fancy calculators. All they had was, what, quill pens, and a, or I don't know, they wrote on a slate. You didn't need high-tech to become a student. And with that knowledge, they developed the greatest free nation the world has ever known. Even in, six, in 18, that was, that was 1647, in 1787, the same Congress that signed or, or ratified our Constitution ratified the Northwest Ordinance. This is the same group in the same year that our Constitution was ratified. And in that Northwest Ordinance, they stated, religion, morality, and knowledge being essential to good government shall forever be encouraged in our schools. That was what? That was, that's over 200 years later. They're still teaching this same doctrine, the purpose for re learning to read. Now, I'm going to introduce you to a personality that most people have never heard of before. I mean, if we stopped out here on the streets of Ogden and did a poll of 100 people, I doubt if anyone has ever heard of Adam Weishaupt. Which father are we following? Well, you know, you, you, I don't want, you don't need to give me the answer. Some of you already know. We're going to look historically back. We're going to trace the threads of history. We're going to look at Weishaupt's teachings, and we're going to look at George Washington's teachings, and we're going to decide here today. We're going to do the old Al Smith test. Remember the great Democrat Al Smith back in the days of FDR? We're going to introduce him a little later, but we're going to do an Al Smith test before we're done. The reason we're doing this is stated at the top here. In any struggle, it is essential to know two things. What we are fighting for and what we are fighting against. Now that's been restated many times. Judge Bork has that in the back page of his book. He says in there the same thing. We need to know what we're fighting against. And he says that's the reason I wrote this huge book is to try and explain what we're fighting against. And he does a masterful job of it, written in 1996. Most of you are familiar with the teachings of George Washington. 
establish a Christian nation under God with liberty and justice for all. But who is aware of the teachings of Adam Weishaupt? The destruction of biblical religion control all governments and rule the world with the Great Society. The Great Society was the name he gave to it in 1776 when George Washington and the Founding Fathers were signing the Declaration of Independence. You know, that group was organizing a free nation under God. Adam Weishaupt was organizing the counterfeit program. He officially, he was in Bavaria. Adam Weishaupt was the professor of religion at Ingolstadt University in Bavaria. He was the department chairman. <laughs> and he, he was organizing through this clout that he had an organization to destroy the Christian religion, overturn the existing governments, and take control of the world. Now this has been a plan by many devious people. He's not the first one or the last one that came up with this idea. But we're going to go back in the thread of history and, and develop a little further what he had to say. Some of his teachings, how was he going to accomplish that? See, we're not going to accept that directly. The old-fashioned frontal assault will not work. He can't come out and say to you, we're going to destroy your Christian religion, we want you all to follow me, because we wouldn't follow him. So he's going to use front organizations and other organizations to accomplish this purpose. This is a slide we've tried to develop to help give you a feel for the continuity of ideology from Adam Weishaupt's day to our day. These are a number of the combinations that were organized uh, starting back around the 1750s where we started way down here in 1750 we have in the different countries and there's certainly a lot more than this could go on the chart <laughs> but this will give us a feeling for the thread of ideology we had over in France the philosophes we had in Germany the continental masonry now notice the names as they progress they're often the same people and they're always the same ideology destruction of the Christian religion, overturn the existing government, replace it with one of your own making, and by the way, along the route, most of them include destruction of family as part of their objectives. Adam Weishaupt certainly did. Here we have Adam Weishaupt over in Germany now. In 1776, on May the 1st, you ever heard of May Day, the great celebration for May Day? On May the 1st, 1776, this gentleman organized the Order of the Illuminati. Now, what did they teach? How were they going to accomplish these objectives? On the front, they were a beautiful, healthy, happy group of the best citizens of the community. He, he appealed to the teachers, the ministers, the businessmen, uh, the good people. And they would join because it was a good social organization. And then they, the, the, those that knew what was going on in the higher levels of the organization, they would kind of feel out as these people joined and participated who they could share their secrets with. Here were some of the strategies that they used. These are quotations from the writings done by Weishaupt and his associates in 1776. Spread our opinions by every method, including art, music, and literature. Now this is direct quotations. These, these are in quotation marks coming out of literature of 1776. And by the way, for every one of these, I have at least two or three or four references from Judge Robert Bork's book in 1996, where he gives examples of how they're happening today. So, we start again. Spread our opinions by every method, including art, music, and literature. Try to obtain influence in the military academies, printing houses, bookseller shops, in short, all offices which have any effect in directing the mind of man. Work together in combinations using secrecy and deception. Use front organizations such as reading societies, subscription libraries, etc. Win the common people chiefly by means of the schools. And Judge Bork emphasizes that over and over in his book. 
that the schools are one of the main vehicles for disseminating the dogma of those who are enemies of freedom. I, I can't overemphasize the importance of reading. Establish a great republic and govern the world. Fill the judgment seats with our worthy members. We had an article in the local newspaper in my community recently encouraging us to be in touch with our judges, that the courts are our courts and not the judge's court, that he's supposed to be judging righteously and following correct principle. Fill the judgment seats with our worthy members. To be worthy, you had to believe in their dogma. Press culture into service. Have you heard anything about multiculturalism? The big movement of today? Press culture into service. Distribute political caricatures and filthy prints. That's pornography. To try and corrupt even people who cannot read. I guess they had a high level of illiteracy back then. Promote a movement for women's liberation. It will cause them to work for us with zeal without knowing that they do so. You ever heard of the feminist movement? The NOW organization? The Equal Rights Amendment? And the long list of other things that fit into that category. Take over church management, academies, the professional chair, and the pulpit. You need to read Judge Bork's chapter on trouble in the churches of America. Preach the warmest concern for humanity. We'll have welfare programs and social programs for everyone. The warmest concern for humanity is one of their strategies. Surround people in positions of leadership with enlightened men. And we'll look at that in a few minutes on a slide. We'll see that President Clinton is surrounded with enlightened men. And they're all enlightened with the same doctrine. And we'll show you the thread of history, how that ideology has passed through. Let's step back for a moment to this. Oh, let, back on that slide. Let me name the names. We, I, last year I tried to go back and forth between slides and it was cumbersome. I'm not going back to this slide, although I have another one that will come up. I want you to look at the names, realizing that they changed. When the order of the Illuminati became extremely unpopular in Bavaria, it was a, kind of a strange circumstance. One of the faithful followers of the Illuminati was struck by lightning and killed. And somebody else came along and found his personal possessions and they went through them and found the writings that he had and realized he was a conspirator against the government. And so the, the leader of the country of Bavaria outlawed the Illuminati. So you can't do that in this country anymore. That's, to, you know, that's uh, overthrowing the government. So they started changing their names. Well, now we call ourselves something else. The Insinuating Brethren, then the German Union, then the Tugendbund. Notice the years are going by. Same ideology, new names. And these organizations then went into the other countries. In France, they were called the Illuminated Freemasonry, and then they changed their name during the French Revolution to the Jacobin Clubs. So when you read a history of the French Revolution, you read about the influence of the Jacobin Clubs. That was the Illuminati of France. The League of the Just, when it arrived up in England, became known as the Communist League. That was the organization that authorized Karl Marx to write the Communist Manifesto, in which he tried to put down the, the ideology of that group of individuals. And in a nutshell, it's the same thing. It's overthrow the Christian religion, overturn the existing government, overturn the family, and replace it with our own social program. The Fabians was another group we'll speak considerably of today and their influence. Then up in, uh, in England in 1891, we had the, so the Society of the Elect. This was a Rhodes project, Cecil Rhodes, the great million, a multi-billionaire probably. He created what he described as a secret society. He then created the round table groups. The round table group set up front organizations. One of them was the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and in America, it was the Council on Foreign Relations. That was a front organization for this secret society. Now, we had numerous other organizations causing problems in the country that all fell into the category described in the opening statement. 
The enemies of God are destroying the core foundation of this land. And this all started to come into focus as I poured over the books. Let's go back in history now to the League of the Just. How well were the, were the doctrines of Karl Marx being received? How well are they received today? This is a 1919 newspaper caricature. Here we have Karl Marx represented in this 1919 political, social scenario as the center figure with his doctrines of socialism under his arm. These are the great financiers. That's Teddy Roosevelt. These are the great, here's Andrew Carnegie. Here's John D. Rockefeller. This is Perkins, part of the Morgan uh, financial uh, monopoly. Here's J.P. Morgan. Turns out we find out later he's a, he's a pawn of the European banking system. These men are all surrounding Karl Marx and embracing enthusiastically his doctrines. Well, we'll go through again the ideology in a few moments. We'll get a few more details on it. It's very close to George Bernard Shaw's program. This is a picture of a stained glass, well, it's a line drawing of a stained glass window in England. It's in Surrey, England. This, is, this was created in the year 1910, the window was, in honor of the great progress and the advancement accomplished by the Fabian Socialist of England. George Bernard Shaw, Sidney Webb, that's these two characters, Edward Pease, H.G. Wells, and a host of faithful followers worshiping at the altar of Fabian Socialist literature. <laughs> And the foundation of the altar is George Bernard Shaw's famous Fabian Tracts and Essays, in which he explains their agenda. I would say their hidden agenda. Well, what was the agenda? Oh, by the way, I got done showing this a few years ago down in Texas, and about two months later, this slide came in the mail. That and the next one in the, in the sequence here. This slide came in the mail with a note and it said, I attended your lecture in Dallas. I was deeply impressed but doubted some of the things. I couldn't believe it was true. You know, this is the nature of his, of his message. And he says, so I called my friend in England and asked him to check it out. And now I'm sending you this beautiful colored slide. My friend took a picture of the stained glass window. And 20 years ago, I got this slide in the mail, something like that. It's the same slide we have all in full color. This is an actual, from an actual photograph of the window by a friend in Surrey, England. And at the bottom of the letter, the guy says, Sincerely yours, Dr. MacDonald, member of the State School Board of Education. Here we have them beating on the world. This is George Bernard Shaw hammering on the world. It's been heated up to red hot. It's on an anvil. This man has a big hammer, they have a big hammer. They're going to do this. You can't read it, you could on the other one. It says remold it nearer to the heart's desire. They're going to remold the world to their heart's desire. Their heart's desire stated in the literature that they're worshiping. And here's the content of the literature. This is no different than Adam Weishaupt. It's the same ideology. Government ownership or control of the land. Slide them on down for me, please. Government ownership or control of the major industry. Government control over labor. Government control or ownership of communications and transportation. Government control of credit. Each of these is worth an hour's lecture, at least. <laughs> A book on each of them. The central banking system we'll talk more of today is the, is the fulfillment of the government control of credit. Government control of insurance. Workmen's compensation, unemployment, social security, and a host of other insurance programs, and now the proposal to have a national medical program for everyone. Government control of the educational system. They felt that this was one of the most important. Elimination of the significance of the family. Today we have the great movement to have more daycare centers, daycare centers before school, daycare centers after school. It was clear back in Eisenhower's day when he declared he would provide care for everyone from cradle to grave. That was Dwight Eisenhower. Elimination of the significance of the family, elimination of the significance of religion, establishment of a minimum wage. 
There's no end to this one. We hear it almost weekly in the news. A universal system of pensions and justified force of, a use of force if necessary. If you don't want to comply, George Bernard Shaw in one of his papers said, if people don't want to comply peacefully to receive the great benefits of our society, we will kill them. That was in a, a, a book for women, by the way. It was a special pamphlet for ladies. Graduated income tax. Now this wasn't in his writing. This is taken from Karl Marx. Their writings are both quite parallel. Here's a close-up of how they intend to accomplish this. This is right back to the friend from, from the Dr. McDonald from Texas, his two slides he sent. This is the close-up of these two men pounding. Can you see the coat of arms? England was great for coats of arms. We have a real good close-up of that one. This is how they intended to accomplish their objectives. FS stands for Fabian Society, and they said we'll do it gradually, a little at a time, here a little and there a little, and no one will ever know what's happening. And so they called themselves Fabians after the great general, the Roman general, Fabius, because Fabian or Fabius was, was known for his strategy of a little at a time. He would surround a community, he would cut off their water supply, he would cut off their food supply, and he would wait till they starved some slow, tedious method of accomplishing his objective. And so through the process of gradualism, like a wolf in a sheep's skin, they're going to do this. Now we're going to take a few of the items that I wished we had an hour each for. We'll take them about two minutes each. This is a map of America. It's an old one. It means it was published 15 or 20 years ago. There's more black now. The black is the land owned by the federal government. Remember the statement on the Fabian socialist literature 150 years ago, government control of the land. Now here's a close up of Nevada, being one of the states where the government has more land than most of the others. This black, the black color is the land owned by the federal government. The white area is owned by the state of Nevada and the private citizens. Some folks want to know what the snake up at the top is. This is where the railroad went through and every other section was awarded to the private ownership. That's why it looks like a little checkerboard. Here's the one that we hear so much about today. Eco-alarm and the totalitarian agenda. The environmental movement. And just the last, oh, it was two weeks ago on the news, we heard several times each day the great conference that was going on to find out how to combat world warming, global warming. Do you remember that about two weeks ago? President Clinton came out with a statement that there's no doubt about it now. We have this terrible crisis about to, be, about to take place. We have to have government intervention. There's no other solution. All the governments of the world will have to work together. You, you heard that. That's on the news right now. Well, in 1974, Time Magazine, Newsweek, and Fortune all published articles saying just the opposite. Science has proven that there's a global cooling. And before long, it'll be a great ice cap and it'll come down over the world. They had literally in three different major news releases, they had the world all cooling down. So today it's warming up, then it was cooling down. Well, there are many leading scientists who say this is all a bunch of balderdash. There isn't sufficient evidence to indicate one thing or the other. And so what we have is government by crisis, where they try to create a crisis to impose more regulation on the citizens. And boy, there's a, a long, that's, that's hours of conference on that topic. Here's another one that was on the list of Fabian socialist goals. This is the front cover of another excellent book by Dr. Murray Rothbard, economist. What has government done to our money? And that's worth another hour's lecture. I used to do a three-hour one on this one. We'll just take a brief summary of what this one's about. In 1907, the financial community understood that to accomplish its ultimate objective, it must have one a privately controlled bank of issue which would regulate credit and money supply and the money supply two a huge public debt on which to base its currency three 
an unrestricted income tax to pay the interest on the debt. Now, this was all decided in 1907 or before. We can, we can, get, we can pick it out of history as, as, late, as early as 1907. So in 1908, the creature from Jekyll Island was formed. Now you can read this in the seven or eight hundred page book on the topic. Excellent documentation, well done. The creature from Jekyll Island. I have a picture of this creature. Now the next one is a picture of the creature from Jekyll Island. You've never seen this before. This is new. What are you going to see? Some kind of a snake? <laughs> it's a combination. A secret combination. In 1908, they organized the basis for our present banking system. These men, you can see the names of them up there, such famous characters as Nelson Aldrich, he was a United States Senator. Let's see, I think Nelson Rockefeller was one of his posterity. Henry Davison, Charles Norton, Andrew, Abraham Andrew, Frank Vanderlip, Benjamin Strong, and Paul Warburg. These men controlled about one-fourth of the wealth of the world. They were big financiers. And their agenda, I just put up there, the previous three points, was their agenda to create a bank system that could make the private financiers wealthy, have an income tax to pay the interest on the debt, and so forth. This is a secret combination. The only one I've got a picture of. That's a picture right out of the book, The, the Creature from Jekyll Island. Here's how they created the system. Now this didn't take place in law until 1913. In 1913, the United States Congress embraced their ideology, put it into law, and it's been what some bankers call the greatest banking system the world has ever known. That's the name that a, a banker told me when he got done listening to my lecture one night. However, I can tell you this, another banker left a note. He said, I'm sorry I have to leave early, but what you said is true. So I had one banker say, it's the greatest system in the world, and the other banker said, what I said was true. So <laughs> anyway, that was when I gave the whole three hours on it. This is a triangle coming out of the Federal Reserve literature. It's, it's a pyramid is what I would like to say. You've heard of pyramid schemes? Well, they drew a pyramid to show how the Federal Reserve System works. And we don't have time to elaborate, but I want a U.S. congressman to give a summary of it. I picked this letter. I haven't used this one for a long time. When I was lecturing in Texas in 1980, this man, Congressman Ron Paul, came up. I gave him five minutes. He gave a little speech. I enjoyed meeting him. Went over to, the, to a visit, or to a home afterwards, had a good visit with him. Enjoyed the man. Since then, I've enjoyed him. This quarter, this is 20 years later, this last quarter, he was the only congressman in the U.S. Congress to get a 100% score on his voting record. That means he voted 100% in favor of constitutional principles. Congressman Ron Paul. You know, if you think that football player, you know how, how he looked all beat and, and hammered? Congressman Ron Paul ought to look like that, but he doesn't. You look at his pictures and he has a picture of determination and sternness, forthright, honest man. Well, here's what he said about the banking system. He was saying it then and he's still saying it. He's published books on this subject. I believe that the present system of unbacked paper currency is theft and that we must return to sound, honest money as soon as possible. That is why I have introduced a bill that would make Federal Reserve notes redeemable in gold at a price set by the market approximately a year and a half from now. Remember, this is 1980. Didn't work, did it? I believe that the present legalized counterfeit money system we have is the cause of many of our problems and has been at the root of the many economic difficulties we have experienced during the past several decades. Well, you deserve to read more. That's all we have time for on that subject. What went wrong? Remember the chief goal of the Weishaupt group in, in 1746 was to use the schools as a tool to manipulate the minds of people. What went wrong? Every year our public schools turn out millions of young adults unprepared for the task of living responsibly in a free society. And the most alarming news is it was planned that way. Well, that sounds preposterous. I couldn't believe it.
We mentioned that the earliest, one of the earliest laws made in America was the Old Deluder Satan Act, in which they encouraged people to learn to read. This went on for a long time. I just want to try and condense this down so I don't drag it out too long. This went on for a long time. The bedrock foundation of our schools, as we mentioned earlier, were neighborhood-centered, parent-directed, professionally-assisted. Now fold up the overlay. This shows that things came to a halt. We'll give a brief summary of what happened. Men like Robert Owen. Now, it's a long time ago. Robert Owen, one of the, he's the father of modern socialism, many people would call him that in history. John Dewey, George Counts, and huge support from the tax-exempt foundations. These people began launching an attack on the neighborhood-centered, parent-directed schools. And they successfully consolidated and pushed us in. I mean, forgive me, as I drove down the f thoroughfare coming to, to the meeting this morning, I see these huge schools that look just like this. I couldn't help but think, I wonder what's being taught in there. Are they teaching the founding of America according to the principles of the fathers of the nation? It went further. A content analysis, and this has been done several times. A content analysis of textbooks gives us this kind of information. In the year 1810, 16 out of 25 pages contained moral content. Now you can see the progression as the years went by. By the year 1950, what grade were you in in 1950? You weren't in a grade yet, were you? <laughs> you were, you, okay, most, you know, some of you were in a grade in 1950. What were they teaching in 1950 that had moral content? 0.06% of the book had moral content, and I assure you it has never improved since then. Now, it helps some people quite, quite envision what I'm talking about. They think, well, you know, my textbooks are good. Dick and Jane run, Dick jump, Jane run. You know, they have all these things about jumping and running. That's what I was learning when I was in school. I want to read a few lines from an 1810 textbook. This textbook is McGuffey Reader. My father was taking McGuffey Reader when he was in school. He's 87, 85 years old now. Did you have McGuffey Kent? <laughs> There's a, a gentleman there that had McGuffey. How many of you had McGuffey when you were in school? No, there's only a few. There were only about four hands raised. And McGuffey went out because it had too much moral content. Let's try the next one and we'll see what McGuffey has to say. Any, any story in McGuffey will give you comparable beautiful moral values. I picked one, made a slide of it. Henry was a kind, good boy. His father was dead and his mother was very poor. He had a little sister about two years old. He wanted to help his mother for she could not always earn enough to buy food for her little family. One day a man gave him a dollar for finding a pocketbook which he had lost. Henry might have kept all the money for no one saw him when he found it. But his mother had taught him to be honest and never to keep what did not belong to him. With the dollar, he bought a box, three brushes, and some blacking. He then went to the corner of the street and said to everyone whose boots did not look nice, Black your boots, sir, please. He was so polite that gentlemen soon began to notice him and to let him black their boots. The first day, he brought home 50 cents, which he gave to his mother to buy food with. When he gave her the money, she said, as she dropped a tear of joy, You are a dear good boy, Henry. I did not know how I could earn enough to buy bread, but now I think we can manage to get along quite well. How many moral values were taught there? I think there's about 10. I counted them up once. I think. In fact, I wrote them all down here. 10 character objectives from the teachings of Jesus. That's what my note to myself was. There are ten character traits from the Bible, with other words, contained in that story. Now let's take a book written in 19, oh, about five years ago or ten, something like that. 
This is one that's probably still in use. It was in use when I got the book just a few years ago in the Utah school system. Okay, this is this story I'm going to do, and you can read any story in here, and you'll get the same vacuum of morality. We chose one and made a slide of it. Rachel had planned her party since last Friday. Her friends arrived early. She greeted each one with a broad smile. She received her presence at the door. She liked the African plant her best friend gave her. Then they all sat down. Rachel's father was going to entertain them. He did magic tricks. He forced a rabbit to stand up. Then he made Rachel's mother float in the air. She was level with the top of the table. She remained in the air for a whole minute. Everyone had a good time. We don't need to evaluate that one, do we? <laughs> the, the onslaught continued at every level. Every level of textbook in America has been tampered with by the combinations who want to impose upon us elimination of the Christian religion, overturn the ex existing government of the Founding Fathers, eliminate the significance of the family, eliminate the significance of religion, and replace it with the Great Society. Here's another. This, that was a grade school level. Here's a high school level book. Does the same thing. This is one page out of a book on American government. The Constitution is like a chain. A rubber chain <laughs> made to be stretched. That's the, that's the words off the page here. And then it goes into the explanation in the next page or two. How the government can stretch the Constitution to mean anything they want. And it's all done in the name of following the Constitution. Then we go to the high school biology books and see how they hammer us there. Actually, this is the front cover off of Life magazine. Life magazine had an article, so did the Reader's Digest. They published the same article a few years ago. How Darwin went wrong. They said, well, now we know that Darwin wasn't right, but we all know evolution happened, just like, you know, something, but we know he didn't have it all together. That's what the article is about. Here's the textbook picture from your local school. This is right out of the page of a Utah biology book being used in Millard County. Somewhere eons of infinite time ago, green scum forming in a tepid primeval sea was your great-grandfather. Much closer, this is the next page out of the same biology book. And by the way, there's not a hint anywhere in the book that this is just a theory. Oh, it uses the word theory, but there's no hint that it's a theory. It's all presented as if it's true. And there's not a hint that there's possibly another alternative to, its, you know, to the interpretation of the data. So, you know, a long time ago, your grandfather was a scum. Well, your grandfather just recently was just a half-breed monkey. And so here we have the story. You've all heard this before, but I show you it's vivid. It's real. It's around us. It's everywhere. It's in our schools also. What's the result of this? I was given a research assignment a few years ago at the Utah State Penitentiary. I spent a week there, every day for eight hours. They had me go to, to, to every part of the, I was given the full run of the prison. The warden said, you can do anything, you know, just don't pretend you're a prisoner. You can go anywhere you want. I asked one of the artists that was in there to help me with some artwork. He drew a whole pile of good drawings. I gave him an assignment. I wanted a drawing of somebody that looked like he was uh, from the parents that were half-breed monkeys and from a scum. And so he drew this character. This was the guy that was supposed to have great-grandparents that were half-breed monkeys and so forth. What's that remind you of? Ever see a guy like that before? In the Millard County newspaper recently, the Millard County Sheriff published an article titled, Please Let There Be a Consequence. And then he pled with the people at the end of the article to contact their judges and other people in authority positions and encourage that they have consequences for disobedience, for violation of the law. This is a common street criminal. That's the image that my, my associate, or I would call him my friend, he was very, very helpful and friendly. 
Here, here's the statistics for Utah. And get in the light ring, see them. This continual revolving door of what I refer to as catch and release has got to stop. There has to be a meaningful consequence for someone who commits crime. Otherwise, what incentive is there to obey the law? Here are some facts for your consideration. In Utah, there is one homicide every six days. One arson every one day. One rape every 10.8 hours. One robbery every six, oops, I gotta get my mind, my eyes on the line. One robbery every 6.5 hours. One aggravated assault every two hours. One vehicle theft every hour. So since we sat down in here and started our program, at least one car has been stolen. One burglary every 32 minutes. One larceny every six minutes. While drug dealing, vandalism, and other serious types of crime are going on constantly. That's a summary of where we are in Utah. Well, there's another history book that you need to know about. This is the newest fourth grade history book in the state of Utah. There's a copy right there. It reached a little, uh, there was a little bit on the news recently about it. Apparently it was adopted rather rapidly, or it's in the experimental stage, perhaps that's how I understood it. We only bought 12,000 of them and distributed them to the schools experimentally at a cost of more than $300,000. I would encourage you to read it and ask these questions. Is this true? Is it balanced? Is this the direction I would like my children's minds to be led? For example, it gives you things in here about religious beliefs that are pantheist beliefs. There's two or three pages that deal with the pantheist doctrine and they do it in a beautiful colored format that's most peaceful and, and lovely. There's teachings in here how the Great Depression was caused, the values of unions, what the free enterprise system is. You need to evaluate this and see if you feel good about what's being presented in your schools and then do something wisely and lovingly with the proper spirit, take some interest and some action in what's being taught. I pledge that I'll write a letter to the editor on it. <laughs> I started it already. Now let's ask the question again. Which father are we following? Now I hope you can remember the long list of 14 things that Adam Weishaupt encouraged his people to do. We're going to take another thread of history. We're going back to where the red circle here is. We're going to take a brief look at the society of the elect and the roundtable groups. To do, to do that, we're going to Oxford University to John Ruskin. Ruskin was an influential teacher, professor. One of his students was Cecil Rhodes. Ruskin wrote of himself and said, Indeed, I am myself a communist of the old school reddest of the red. He imbued Cecil Rhodes with his ideology. Cecil Rhodes went out and became a successful businessman. There's a brand new book out. I saw it in the bookstore yesterday. Brand new book on Cecil Rhodes. Gives his life history. I'd love to read it. Cecil Rhodes used his influence and his wealth throughout the world. Among other things, he created the Rhodes Scholarship Fund. Have you ever heard of a Rhodes Scholar? President Bill Clinton is a Rhodes Scholar and numerous others, you know, that do that. The Rhodes Scholarship was to push on the ideology, and I've got it written down here quoting from the material. Rhodes Scholars were provided, or Rhodes Scholarships were provided to develop men with, quote, smugness, brutality, unctuous rectitude and tact. 
<laughs> Those are Cecil Rhodes' words. I want my leaders to be smug and have unctuous rectitude, whatever that is. <laughs> brutality and tact. Put them both together, brutality and tact. Mandel House in America established the front organization for Cecil Rhodes Roundtable groups. Mandel House was the advisor to Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson said of Mandel House, I, mean, I, I want to get the words exact, he said, his thoughts and mine are one. Now he said that repeatedly. For years they were bosom buddies in the same pod, if you can consider peas in a pod. His thoughts and my thoughts are one. His thoughts were stated in a book that he wrote called Philip Drew Administrator. In that book he said, my dream is to have is establish socialism as dreamed of by Karl Marx. His thoughts and my thoughts are one. And we follow the ideology as it developed, the laws that were made, the systems that came about, and we see from the earliest, oh, from Woodrow Wilson's day to ours, we see the ideology of Mandel House influencing stronger and stronger the top leaders of government in the United States. Somebody went to the trouble of making up a chart showing the Council on Foreign Relation members in the last 12 presidential administrations. I only put half the chart on the slide. I just wanted you to see this list here. Those that are in capital letters, dark letters, like the dark black letters there, these are members of this influential organization that has an agenda established by a man that said, I dream of establishing socialism, like that dreamed of by Karl Marx. And so we have here 18 top federal positions. You can see what they are over here, you know, Secretary of State, Vice President, and so on. And of the 18 top positions, 16 are filled with people who believe in that ideology enough to join the club. Now they may not all believe everything that the, the Council on Foreign Relations teaches, but they are members of that organization. And it's interesting. The Al Smith test. In 1928, Al Smith ran for president. He would have made a great one. The Democrats had a wonderful platform then. It was a platform based on the principles of the Founding Fathers. He lost the election. He helped Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt won in 32. Four years later, Al Smith stood and gave a great speech. And in that great speech, he pled with the Democrats to return to the Democratic platform of 1932. And he said, I want you to make a test. Take the Socialist Party platform and the Democratic Party platform and lay them on the table side by side. And then examine what the administration is doing. And then you lay your hand on the platform which most closely corresponds to what's taking place in America today. You would not dare put your hand on the Democratic Party platform. Then there was Norman Thomas. He was still outspoken and loud after the, Rose, the Eisenhower administration. Norman Thomas was the leader of the Socialist Party, the one that authored the platform that Al Smith said you'd have to put your hand on as to what direction America had gone. Norman Thomas had a right to be happy. He observed the Democrats in action. He observed the Republicans in action. And after the Eisenhower administration had done their thing, he said, I don't need to run for president anymore. The Democrats and Republicans have done everything I ever hoped for, short of a victory at the polls. Those are the words of the leader of the Socialist Party of America, Norman Thomas. In brief, they trashed the Constitution. This is a political caricature showing a justice of the court throwing the Constitution in the garbage. Our Constitution has been trashed for about 50 years. How do they vote? This is how we can determine how they're doing today. We look at the voting record. It's published frequently in numerous sources. Here's the constitutional voting record for this last quarter. And you know, you hear that the Republicans and Democrats 
making statements like, you know, now we have a majority of Republicans, we're going to win, win, win. If you take a look at the voting record, you'll find that for the last eight years, I, I've got them that far back, there's been no change. There, here's the actual percent. In the year 1990, the House average score was 33% for the Constitution. In 1998, it's 30, now did I say 32% in 1990 and 33% in 1998, eight years later. This is after eight years of when we claimed it would make a difference by having a Republican majority in the House and Senate. It didn't make any difference. The Senate got 39% in 1990 and 37% in 1998. Wished we had more time. We don't. We're running out. Both ways. The naked communist stated the agenda. Forty years ago, they stated the agenda of the Communist Party in America. See if any of this sounds familiar. These are the goals of communism documented by W. Cleon Skousen when he was working in the FBI for the 16 years with J. Edgar Hoover. Here's what he published 40 years ago. Promote the United Nations as the only hope for mankind. Demand that it be set up as a one world government with its own independent armed forces. Capture one or both of the political parties in the United States. Get control of the schools. Use them as transmission belts for socialism. Soften the curriculum. Get control of teachers' associations. Put the party line in textbooks. Infiltrate the press. Get control of book review assignments, editorial writing, policy making positions. Gain control of key positions in radio, TV, and motion pictures. Continue discrediting American culture by degrading all forms of artistic expression. Eliminate all good sculpture from parks and buildings. Substitute shapeless, awkward, and meaningless forms. Seen any shapeless, awkward forms around here lately? <laughs> Control the art critics and directors of art museums. You need to read Judge Bork's book, The Chapter on Art. He'll give you a whole list of examples of what's in the art museums and what kind of art is being subsidized by the federal government today, like the piss Christ. Our plan is to promote ugliness, repulsive, meaningless art. Break down the cultural standards of morality by promoting pornography and obscenity. Pornography is the leading, a leading industry in America today. Present homosexuality, degeneracy, and promiscuity as normal lifestyle. Infiltrate the churches. I'm sorry I have to condense this down. I want you to know all of these goals were accomplished. So when someone says communism died, all they did was change their name. This is the same strategy that Adam Weishaupt did when the government came down on him in Bavaria in 1776. He changed the name to the German Brethren, the Tugendbund. Here we have a list of 13 different communist organizations that changed their name when communism was, was no longer popular. And the name change always includes something that's socially acceptable in the area they're in, usually including the word democracy. We're going to bring democracy to the world. You've heard that statement in recent years many times. Well, there's lots of books to read, but that's one I recommend. We're going to skip by some of these. Let's not skip this one. In, in, Adam, in Adam Weishaupt's day, in the, in the historical readings of Reverend Kelly, the Catholic father writing the history of that, we read about mountains of bodies that will be a result if we follow those hideous programs. This is a picture of the American war casualties, kind of a bar graph. The little crosses represent 25,000 lives lost in each of those wars. Here's a picture of the mountains of bodies coming from the Supreme Court decision in 1973. Each of those crosses represents 25,000 lives since 1973. The chart is not long enough. It expired. It's, it's only up to 1996. I would have to have another inch and a half of space on the bottom. There are current newspaper clippings here of San Francisco City, Harvard University, numerous government and private organizations who are now adopting programs to accommodate the gay and lesbian movement. So here we're down to the bottom line. 
what should we do? Doesn't this man have determination in his face? <laughs> See the resolve? He got his uniform washed. That was, that's what the advertisement was about, how clean his uniform came. He batched up his bruises, and he's ready to go into the battle again. I love you good people. I wept when this program started. My wife told me to bring two handkerchiefs. She looked around as we started our program and she said, you know, this is the only place I can think of where I could leave my purse on the chair and feel good about it, not worry about anybody bothering it. As she looked around at you and realized the kind and quality of people that are here today. Those of you that I don't know, I love you too. I have only the kindest feelings of compassion and love in my heart for everyone. I have no bitterness or animosity toward any soul in the world. I sorrow over the sins and the evils that are going on and would hope that I can have some insight in how to overcome them. And like our opening statement, we need to understand the struggle that we're fighting against or we can't, we can't deal with it. We've got to understand the problem. As I went through the big stack of books, I decided I would make a title for this program this morning. This title is also my conclusion. This is the title of my presentation. From freedom to slavery, while slouching toward Gomorrah with the creature from Jekyll Island, during the stealing of America by secret societies and subversive movements in a conspiracy against God and man, thus placing freedom on the altar with the help of Hollywood. Thank you. Well, here we are back to work. I want to ask a quiz question. What did the Founding Fathers cast on the Liberty Bell? What were the words? Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. You remember that football player we saw right at the end of the conference? He had the tape on his nose, his uniform was washed and clean, and he was ready with determination to get started again. Some of us wonder, what should we do? How do we get involved appropriately? We'd like to address that in the second part of this video presentation. So come on, follow me, let's go into the shop. Intense heat of this kind has been used for thousands of years to refine metal. Sometimes they call it a refiner's fire. The teaching point that we'd like to make at this station is that we must become moral and righteous. There's an old cliche that says you must strike while the iron's hot. Remember the picture of George Bernard Shaw back at the Constitutional Forum? He and Sidney Webb and Edward Pease were pounding on the world which they had heated and put on an anvil. But the slogan or their motto was at the top, remold it nearer to our heart's desire. But they had a heart's desire that was inappropriate. It was to their heart's desire. And their heart's desire was not in harmony with the teachings of our Heavenly Father. We need to take control of our own lives and reshape our lives to fit in harmony with the moral teachings of Jesus.
Well, that's an operation that lots of people have never seen before. We enjoy our work. I'm an enthusiastic wheelwright. We've been doing this now for about 10 years. We've had the pleasure of sending wheels to various parts of the United States and had the fun of building some old and unique wagons and carriages and hand carts and things like that. We must be righteous and moral. What does this mean in the context of America? We've talked about liberty. We've talked about proclaiming liberty throughout the land, but how do we do that? The very first point, we must be righteous and moral. As I think about how to teach that point, I think about a wonderful experience I had in Texas a few years ago while teaching a constitutional seminar. After the seminar, two distinguished gentlemen came up to me and they, were, they said they were from the Accelerated Christian Education School System. They invited me to come see their model school. They had schools in 107 foreign countries. More than 5,000 schools at that time were set up. Now this was 25 years ago and they've expanded since then. The thing that impressed me most was when I asked the tour guide who was about a 17-year-old young lady, I said, what's your purpose here? And she said with happiness in her face, I'm learning to be a missionary for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I was thrilled to be a part of the tour to see this, this fine exhibit of how education should be. They taught the moral values of America in every subject. Well, they had gone to the trouble to evaluate the teachings of Jesus in great detail, and they published what they called the 60 character traits of Christ. They were beautiful. And I, you know, if somebody put me on the spot and said, name 10 good character traits, I'd be hard pressed to come up with 10, except that I learned some as a Boy Scout. Trustworthy, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, reverent, plus 48 more character traits coming directly from the Bible. So when we say the first and most important thing to do is to be righteous and moral, we're talking about getting your own life in order and living a standard of biblical morality. This is an interpretation of a Gutenberg printing press. Johannes Gutenberg in about the year 1450 came up with a way of making movable type and some kind of a method of impressing the type against paper with ink on the type. He was able to print the first books. Of course, he's famous for his Gutenberg Bible. The teaching point that we'd like to make at this station is we must learn the principles of the Constitution and abide by its precepts. Well. Written material since Gutenberg's day has been an important part of the learning process. Let's just show you kind of how this press works. This uh, great big wooden screw in here is twisted with this lever. There's a device down here called a platen, which is a very hard, solid block of wood. And by cranking the type under the block, the type sets in here on a polished marble stone. By cranking the type under the block and then squeezing the lever, you can make an impression. It's done something like this. It's a large heave ho pull. <laughs> then they can take the uh, material back out again with the crank. They raise the paper holder, remove the printed page. It was a pretty exciting breakthrough. Prior to the Gutenberg Press, they only had a few thousand books in all of Europe. And 50 years later, they had millions of books. You know, a long time ago, even way before Gutenberg, they were writing books by hand, and one of the Old Testament Bible statements that rem I was reminded of says, of making books there is no end. Of making books there is no end. You go to the library, you look around, you'll see that that's true. It's the mark of a truly educated person to know what not to read. So how do we choose what to read and what not to read? Let's take a little simple book like this, for example. The Mainspring of Human Progress by Henry Grady Weaver. He's got some great truths in here. It's worth reading. This is one of the books you should read. For example, he says, All of the evil done by murderers, gangsters, and thieves is negligible 
in comparison with the evil done by social do-gooders. This, this is a good book, worthy of reading. Here's another one. This is a great book. I mentioned earlier in the presentation about Robert Bork's book, Slouching Toward Gomorrah. Here's another fine book. This presentation is about how the Supreme Court has been used to misdirect America. His title is The Tempting of America, The Political Seduction of the Law. Here's another great one. This was one of my very favorites because I had the privilege of helping in the research on this book. This is the great text, The Making of America, The Substance and Meaning of the Constitution by W. Cleone Skousen. I love this grand old man. He's done a great amount of good for my life. These kinds of books and others will help you in understanding the principles and practices of good government. We must learn these principles and then abide by them so that we're able to share them with others. I want to use an old cliche to make the next teaching point. There's something wrong with this press. It's too new. You've heard the statement that it's the truth that hurts. Well, the truth is that it's too new. Somehow we've got to make it look like it was around for 100 years or so. So we're going to take this rusty tire chain and we're going to wrap it a few times around the legs of the press and we're going to put some age on this. Ah, it's looking better now. <laughs> we'll do some more of that after we get done making our point. It's the truth that hurts. There are rather a long list of truths that hurt about America. Many of us don't want to deal with these truths. Let me share a few of them with you. During the past 25 years in the United States, 38 million babies have been offered in human sacrifice to the false gods we worship. This atrocity began with the Supreme Court decision of Roe versus Wade. A committee of nine lawyers called the Supreme Court have invented a constitution which no one drafted or ratified. Our federal social programs are completely and totally unconstitutional. The Federal Reserve System is probably the biggest scam and the most sophisticated form of thievery the world has ever known. There are virtually no limitations on Congress except those which they choose to place upon themselves. President Bill Clinton ought to be impeached for any one of a number of serious violations. America has gradually evolved from a constitutional republic into a welfare state ruled by representative democracy. The United States is now by far the world's leading producer of pornography. Americans spent more than eight billion dollars on pornography last year. Americans are slouching toward Gomorrah. Well, these are truths that we don't want to hear. We don't want to deal with them. We'd rather they just disappeared and went away. The truths we like to hear are things like, what are the scores of the latest basketball game? What's the best video movie to see? Oh, I remember when Titanic, last week or so, Titanic was the big talk of the local community. Communism is dead. Our freedom is guaranteed by the Constitution. And other high-sounding truths like they serve good Cokes at the local Chevron station. These are the kind of things we want to hear that we can deal with. But our problem solving has got to start back with the great fundamental truths of our founding fathers biblical morality, and the Constitution according to its original intent. You can make a good rope out of any number of different kinds of fiber, any fiber that you can twist. That you, can, that you can make a twine out of, you can make a rope out of, like horsehair works just great. In early Utah history, the first rope maker was a pioneer that settled along the shores of Utah Lake. And there he twisted rope from the natural fibers that were growing there. And after he twisted his ropes, he took them to town and traded them for food. And in his journal he wrote, those were hard times. Many years later, when times were much better, a great statesman named J. Reuben Clark, and his, his list of accomplishments is long. 
He was the Under Secretary of State for the United States. He was the Ambassador to Mexico. He had law offices in several major cities. His accomplishments were notable. He wrote a book called Stand Fast by the Constitution, still sound reading today. He gave speeches across the nation explaining, he, did, he gave more than 125 major addresses on the importance of upholding and defending the Constitution. In 1942, he made one of those speeches from, uh, at a national broadcast in Salt Lake City. And in those remarks in 1942, he said, you have heard all your lives that the day would come when the Constitution would hang by a thread. I do not know if it now hangs by a thread or by a small rope, but whether it lives or dies is now in the balance. Well, if it was now in the balance in 1942, we're in big trouble now. And we need people, we need many citizens to participate wisely and lovingly in understanding the principles and practices of good government so that we can become wisely involved in solving our nation's problems. The third teaching point that we would like to make today, we must become involved in civic affairs. I think about Pope John Paul II, Dr. James Dobson, Dr. James Kennedy, and other modern clergy. They have long been urging the people in their congregations to become involved. Recently, in fact, I'd say in a letter that's hot off the press, since we have this Gutenberg Press as our backdrop, I'd like to share with you a letter. This is dated January the 15th, 1998. It's a letter from Gordon B. Hinckley, Thomas S. Monson, and James Faust, clergy in Utah. In this letter, they urge the members of their church to be full participants in political, governmental, and community affairs. We wish to reiterate the... Well, what I'd like to tell you, folks, is that... I'm sorry I couldn't read the letter to you. This is a letter that has a lot of meaning to me. Sometimes when we hear a letter or we hear counsel or advice, we don't remember it very long and we have to reinforce it. This, this particular document was to be read in all the LDS Church sacrament meetings in the United States. So those that were attending those meetings probably heard it, but oftentimes when we don't focus and, and practice and try something out that we hear, it soon vanishes from our minds like a wisp of smoke. I would urge you to ask your ecclesiastical leader for a copy. Or you can read it in the February 7th Church News of the Deseret News newspaper. It's a great letter. It'll give you solid guidelines to help you become involved in civic affairs. There are several organizations that provide excellent reading material. These organizations would send you both a book list and a, like a monthly publication, like a newsletter. I want to give you the names and the addresses of these organizations. They each have their specialty. The name is usually explanatory. There's the National Center for Constitutional Studies. I used to be the field director for this organization. It's worthy of your time communicating with the leadership and obtaining their literature, and perhaps you would even be motivated to put on a constitutional seminar in your community. Then there's the National Federal Lands Conference. They have their own specialty. Their specialty is public lands and the private rights in the use of public lands. Then there's the Foundation for Economic Education. This one has a long history. They've been around since the early 1940s. Some very notable people have served on their board of directors. Some that I'm familiar with that have served on their board were J. Reuben Clark, great statesman, great American. J. Reuben Clark served there on their board of directors for 11 years. Not long after his term, we had two other very notable people serve on the board of directors, each at different times. One was Ernest Wilkinson, who served for about nine years on the board of directors, and then there was Ezra Taft Benson, who served for 10 or 11 years on the board of directors. The organization deals with economic issues, but they also put out a lot of good information on just fundamental constitutional principles. The Foundation for Economic Education, very respected organization. Then there's another one on environmental issues. And, you know, we were bombarded with 
global warming, global cooling, uh, ozone layers, and all these other things that uh, the greenhouse effect and everybody's going to die, you know, radical elements. The only solution is the federal government taking over. Well, here's one that will give you some wholesome freedom solutions to the environmental issues. It's called PERC. And you'll get the address off the screen. So if you want some wholesome, uplifting, enjoyable ideas that you probably won't conceive of, you'll see a free enterprise solution to how to take care of our environmental problems. Contact them. PERC. There's one more that you should be in touch with. This is a monthly, they send out a monthly newsletter. It's from Hillsdale College. And the newsletter is called Imprimus. Excellent material. You'll enjoy it. It's uh, some of the finest speakers in the country speaking on the issues of our day. From Hillsdale College, Imprimus. The last point we'd like to make. We must make our influence felt. There's a scripture I'm reminded of. By small means the Lord can bring about great things. I've noticed in my life many times that small things have had a great influence for good on me. By small means, the Lord can bring about great things. We've asked the question right at the first of this concluding section of our video, what should we do? There are many excuses for not doing anything. Two of the most common excuses are, I'm too busy. When I thought about that excuse, I thought about a poem. I don't remember all of the poem, I remember part of it. The part I remember goes like this. No time for God. No time to eat, to drink, to sleep, to die. Take time for God, or a poor misshapen soul you'll be, to step into eternity and say, I have no time for thee. Let's rephrase that to go with the theme of our presentation here. No time to preserve freedom. No time to preserve liberty. Take time to preserve freedom. Or a poor misshapen soul you'll be to step into eternity and say, I had no time to preserve liberty. The other excuse is, it's too late. There's nothing I can do. And besides that, what I do wouldn't make any difference anyway. Let's talk about that one for a moment. I'm reminded of the story of Jonah. Remember the Old Testament, Jonah and the whale? Jonah was sent to the city of Nineveh. He was supposed to preach repentance to a very wicked people. Jonah went finally, with, <laughs> with some pressure from his heavenly father, he finally went and started his mission. He preached repentance, and then he sat down on the sidelines and waited waited for the city to be destroyed because he figured it was too late and really there was nothing he could do. Well, to his great disappointment, the people began to repent and Heavenly Father did not destroy the city. Some of us are like Jonah. We want to sit on the sidelines and say, oh, it's too late. There's nothing I can do. What I do won't help or have an influence in America. Take a lesson from the Old Testament. I remember a little old lady sending me a letter. This is just a small thing. You know, we can say there's nothing I can do. This little old lady wrote me a letter when I was really hurting. I was tired and wore out. I'd been traveling all over the country giving lectures several nights a week, very little time at home. And I got it at a time when I was despondent and, and emotionally stressed out. And it was one page of scriggly writing from a little old hand. I met this little lady later on. What a beautiful old woman. She was writing to encourage me, to encourage me to keep up the work that I was doing, how much she appreciated it, and how much her family appreciated it. And it was just what I needed at that time. So people that say, there's nothing I can do, I ask you, can you write a letter? Can you write a letter of encouragement? Be prayerful and thoughtful about it. Who needs my letter of encouragement? Benjamin Franklin was 81 years old when he participated at the Constitutional Convention, one of the great Americans, and age didn't seem to be the problem. There was another woman I remember in 
traveling about. It was up in Wyoming. She was a middle-aged woman, all probably in her early 30s. And she was going to be the chairman of the Conference on Our American Heritage and the Constitution. On some rural community up in, every community is rural in Wyoming. I remember she had called together a, a group of the citizens and she had what she called a committee and they were going to organize this constitutional seminar. The constitutional seminar was supposed to start in about six weeks. And so she asked for a proposed date. When should we have this event? How about September? Oh no, the, the, the committee members said, no, not in September. That's when school starts and that surely wouldn't work. Well, how about October? No, no, October wouldn't work. That's when football season starts and we'll all be involved in, in, in our children's football activities. How about November? No, that's basketball season. It wouldn't work then. How about December? No, Christmas and Christmas vacation never work then. How about January? No, some of us are ranchers and we like to vacation in January. We'll be going to Baja. And that little lady, she stamped her foot down and she said, if you won't help me, I'll do it myself. And she surely did. And so she had a fine conference. We had about 70 people from this small rural community attend. I was the speaker, and to me it was a great event. Is there something we can do? Yes. It affected my life to be there in the presence of this fine young woman as she led out holding a constitutional seminar. And I believe we probably had an influence for good on others who attended. Well, are you still asking the question, what should we do, or what should you do, or I do? It depends on your talents and your capabilities. It depends your interest, on your interest and your background. Make your influence felt. Can you write a letter? Depending on your talent and ability, it might determine who you write that letter to. Can you make a phone call? Can you hand out a videotape or a book? Now, this is, this is a powerful way to influence other people for good. Can you study the issues and the candidates and measure them against a constitutional standard and then vote wisely? Can you become wisely informed and let others know how you feel? This is important. Make your influence felt. I feel like this video needs a powerful ending. I feel like it needs an ending that has noise and smoke and flames and where the message comes up out of a glowing bed of embers. So we're going to do that. Smoke and flames in a glowing bed of embers will help us to reinforce the four teaching points that we hopefully have made this in these conclusions. Ben, would you please cut this out? Let's review the four points that we've tried to make here at the shop. We must be righteous and moral. We must learn the principles of the Constitution, abide by its precepts, and share them with others. We must become involved in civic affairs. We must make our influence felt. Well written in flames and smoke and noise, we have a suggested model. Many of you have heard this model before, but we want you to apply it to these four important
principles that we've just reviewed. Do it now.